Welcome to Aircrew Interview, I'm Mike from your host, and in this episode we chat with former F-100 and F-105 pilot Vic Biscara. In part two, we chat about his time flying the F-105 Thunder Chief, which again includes some amazing stories, what the aircraft was like to handle, flying it over in Vietnam, and of course that famous ejection. Thank you and enjoy. Well, Vic, we're here to talk about the 105, and you're the first pilot on the channel to have flown the 105, so this is going to be really interesting for me. So, yeah, yes. so tell us about how you first, well, how you got posted to the 105. The 105, uh, when it was coming into the inventory, was going to be the main replacement for the uh, F-100. The, the F-100 was Tactical Air Command's mainstay fighter. Uh, over 2,000 uh, F-100s had been built. So uh, the 105 was coming in as its replacement. Mm -hmm. It originally was slated to have about 2,000 built. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, McNamara uh, stopped that. Well, let's see, was it McNamara or, or was it some general officer? Uh, anyway, they cut it way back from a buy of 2,000 to 833 uh, 105s. So like I say, it was, it was going to be the primary replacement for it. So... Sure enough, after being fly, after flying the F-100 for 16 months, uh, I got uh, posted to uh, 105s, and um, uh, at that time, they were only putting experienced spots in the 105 because the 105 was brand new, and so uh, uh, I got to, when I got that assignment, I uh, went over to Nellis Air Force Base, where uh, that was the schoolhouse originally for the F-105. And since they were only putting experience spots in there, it was a, a short course, only 30 hours in it. Oh, wow. And uh, okay. then 30 hours, a little holy water on it, and you were one, you know, one of five followed. <laughs> yeah, wow. So, yeah, you kind of alluded to it before, but what were your first thoughts on the jet? Because coming from the 100, that must have felt like a house compared to that jet. Oh, yeah. I, I, again, I got in it, and first time I sat in, I thought to myself, my gosh, this is big. I hope I can handle it, you know. But I'll tell you what, I fell in love with it, in love with it immediately because the airplane was ahead of its time. It was very well uh, designed. Uh, the uh, uh, human element of, of uh, in the cockpit, first of all, huge cockpit, very comfortable cockpit. And like I say, ahead of its time, it, it had the vertical tapes instead of the steam gauges. Uh, I really like the vertical tapes. Mm -hmm. uh, people have asked, uh, asked me, well, what's it like? Uh, did it take a lot to get used to that? And I'll tell you, going from steam gauges to tapes was a piece of cake, uh, and it spoiled you. Now when you had to go back to steam gauge, <laughs> now, now you had the problems. <laughs> yeah. you know? so, but uh, uh, to give an example of uh, the well design of that airplane uh, with that Republic uh, took into consideration is there was a built-in thermos bottle right behind the headrest of the oh. uh, uh, pot, uh, and there was a, a tube that would snap to a little snap here, and uh, when you're coming off the target, you'd, you'd uh, with the adrenaline pumping through, uh, you ended, ended up getting what's called uh, cotton mouth, very dry. Right. So, man, a good sip of water was just the right thing, you know. So with the 105, you'd come off the tire, get get off, uh, headed home, nice, and now you can relax, and now you can take a <laughs> a little sip of the water. You know? uh, a story about that is uh, a good friend of mine <clears throat> who uh, uh, flew <clears throat> their very first uh, anti-SAM flight uh, with me. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. When... Um, after we came off the target, when uh, he's headed home, he had that cotton mouth feeling again, and he wanted a drink so bad, but he thought, oh, no problem. Well, unfortunately, when uh, the uh, crew chief had snapped the uh, little hose on the clamp, he left too big of a, of a loop, and when my buddy had closed the canopy, it had closed on oh. the loop. <laughs> So he couldn't get any water. <laughs> <coughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so um, obviously, what was the the role of the 105, uh, 105 in your time the same as the 100? Or was there a bit of a difference? 
uh, initially the same thing. It primary was uh, tactical nuclear. You know, it was designed as a uh, low altitude, high speed tactical nuclear asset delivery. You know, it had a bomb bay. Uh, now, the only thing you could put in bomb bay was a nuclear uh, uh, bomb. You, you couldn't. It, uh, it wasn't certified for conventional weapons. So in Vietnam, uh, we filled the bomb bay with a extra fuel tank, big, big 390-gallon e extra fuel. Tell us about your first flight, and could you tell the power difference coming from the 100? Because that thing looked like a beast taking off. Uh, uh, let me tell you, that's probably a first, fl a first flights. That was the most memorable first flight because when I checked out in the 105, they didn't have the two seaters yet, so your first flight uh, in a 105 was so. I mean, you're you're by yourself, uh, so that was a great feeling to get in an airplane that you've never flown, and go and take it off all by yourself. Now, uh, you you would uh, what what they would do is you the day before uh, your first flight, you'd go out to the airplane, sit in it, and get cockpit time, and. Uh, your instructor would go up on, on, on the ladder of the wing and watch you start the airplane up, go through all the checks, and then shut it down. And then he'd, they'd say, okay, go home and think about it now because tomorrow you're doing this by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a scary thought. <laughs> yeah, but I'll tell you what, it's a very uh, really a feeling of accomplishment hopping in an airplane that you've never flown and just take it off by yourself. Yeah. So, what kind of what engine did the 105 have? Had a J75, which was the big brother to the J57 that was in the uh, um, 100. Uh, marvelous engine, uh, tough, rough engine, uh, and um, uh, but it also ha happened uh, depending on the circumstances. Uh, you know, uh, it's ingested. Uh, uh, gun panels and all that, and kept on ticking like good old Timex. And then there's been the case of the Golden BB, that just the right one that puts out of, out of commission. But uh, uh, overall, uh, very good, tough engine. So what kind of uh, fl uh, flying training would you be conducting going through your training on the 105? And how did it differ compared to the 100? Because obviously I'm guessing it could carry a lot more payload. Yeah, yes, uh, and ag again... In that time frame, the, so the emphasis was on uh, nuclear deterrence. So just like in the 100, when you went on 105, again, the big uh, emphasis was on nuclear delivery. And and uh, here's something that, that uh, you may not be aware of. I, I, I know a lot of people weren't aware of it. Uh, since the 105 also had a radar scope and had a, a great air to ground for its day, a great air to ground radar and uh, uh, coming out of 100s we didn't know how to operate or look at a radar yeah. so the checkout program in the uh, uh, 105 also included flying in uh, a T-37 a, a T-30 T-39 North American T-39 uh, Sabre liner uh, so pilot in a co pilot seat would be uh, a student, a 105 student, with a radar scope uh, in, in his position, and then there'd be four stations in the back uh, with uh, radar scopes. So you could have five students up there yeah. flying, practicing how to use the radar. And how quickly did you get used to that? Uh, so surprisingly, uh, uh, fairly quick because it was a short program. Like I said, uh, it was only 30 hours to begin with. But uh, uh, with that's 30 hours uh, program in the 105 plus the hours in the 30, uh, T-39. I forget how many flights and hours we got in the T-39. But uh, it, it was a great aid in checking you out on how to use the radar. Yeah, it's crazy thinking about this time when sometimes it takes like years and years to just go through a training program. And 30 hours uh, is not a lot at all. No. But uh, let's talk about uh, yeah how the aircraft handled and what were the strengths and weaknesses of the aircraft. Well, okay, as far as handling, it was a very solid, stable airplane, much more stable uh, than the uh, 100. So it was an excellent 
uh, gun platform, if you want to call it, a mm -hmm. uh, weapons delivery pl platform. Uh, very stable airplane, didn't have the adverse yaw uh, characteristics of a 100. Uh, the its strengths was speed, and like I said before, the old axiom, speed is life. Uh, that baby loved to go fast. The faster it was going, the faster it wanted to go. Uh, so that's that was a strength. Its weakness was because it was so fast and it wanted to go fast, it also wanted to go in a straight line. <laughs> it was not a very good turning fighter. Although it, it held its own against MiGs in Vietnam. I mean, it, it had a pos positive exchange ratio. Uh, it had a one, it wasn't very high positive, but it was a 1.2 to 1 kill ratio uh, mm -hmm. over MiGs. So, That's not too bad. Yeah, so what, what kind of speeds would uh, the 105 get to if you really pushed it? Uh, at uh, sea level, uh, it was limited to 810 knots. And the, its limitation was uh, the airplane could go faster than that, and, and in fact actually did go faster than that. Its limitation was that the canopy would start heating up at uh, above 810 right. knots. And the canopy seal sealant uh would start melting so uh so it's it was limited to eight tenths because of that but in vietnam i think i, I don't recall what the highest uh reported uh, speed was uh but i know it's uh 850 or 870 on the deck wow being chased by migs and, and, the, and the migs could keep you know couldn't keep up with her couldn't get it so. absolutely so, yeah. yeah, did you ever get to train uh, for ACM or DACT uh, on the 105? And how did you fare against, you know, the types of the time when you were training? Yeah, we, we, we did do that a lot. Uh, no, I shouldn't say a lot. We did do that. Uh, but, uh, again, since it was a tactical nuke uh, fighter bomber, the emphasis was on air to ground. So we, uh, I'm trying to remember doing it. I ever did DC, the DCA. Um, in the 105, I remember doing uh, the uh, the similar uh, in the 100. Uh, uh, flew against the Navy F-8 uh, Crusader, which was a I've always admired that airplane, the yeah. F-8 Crusader. Uh, mm -hmm. airplane. Uh, I, I I fought uh, F-8 Crusaders in the 100, and man, uh, that was a handful doing that. Uh, <laughs> in 105, I'm trying to remember uh, what I went against uh, in uh, DC DACM. Um, don't remember ever doing that in the in the one hundred uh, in the one hundred five. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, in in your training, did you actually drop live uh, munitions to get up to speed? You know, for what you were going to do, uh, you know, later on. Uh, very limited, but uh, you you would go out to a tactical range and use uh, real live munitions. Uh, but that was rarely. Uh, uh, you had a requirement. I don't remember how often we had to do it. I don't know. I don't remember if it was yearly or, or more often than that, but we did have a requirement to go out and drop a nuclear shape. Uh, oh you know, it, it, yeah. it was a, it was the shape and size of a nuclear uh, munition, uh, cement filled instead. But uh, we did have a requirement to go out there and drop one of those. I think it was annually. Mm -hmm. uh, a story about that was uh, you over uh, in. Uh, Aishima, a uh, small island off of uh, Okinawa, which uh, was a gunnery range. And uh, uh, when the, the Kabina wing would do their uh, annual shape drop, uh, the Ryukans, uh, the natives there, uh, had little suction cups with a colored flag. Uh, each had his own color identified. It was his flag. And uh, you'd go in there and you <clears throat> do a lab and you recover the top of your lab's maneuver uh, and you could look down there. And before the bomb even hit the ground, you could tell what kind of bomb you were laying down, how good you're, you're how close to the target you get from the crowd of the Ryukans <laughs> running to uh, plant their little flag. And it, it, it's, it's surprising somebody didn't get killed because, man, that bomb would hit the dust and, man, there'd be... <laughs> You know, close to 100 guys. They're trying to plant their little flag on the <laughs> on the uh, bomb to uh, claim it, get uh, get a reward back out of it. You know, bloomin' heck! But uh, yeah, so could you tell us what your first frontline squadron was and where you got posted to? Yes, uh, 
It was the uh, 80th Tech Fighter Wing uh, in uh, Itazuki, Japan, uh, uh, a very famous uh, uh, air base, uh, became famous from the uh, song uh, Itazuki Tower. You know, it's, mm. uh, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it's a, quite an amusing little ditty. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, so it was posted to that. Uh, I reported in. New Year's Eve, 1963. <laughs> oh. So, so that's when I reported in there. Um, so then, uh, the big challenge was you had to go over there unaccompanied first. You had to go overseas unaccompanied first, and locate a house. And then, once you got a house, uh, then they would cut the orders on the family and bring the family over there. Right. So, uh, so report in there, like I said, uh, New Year's Eve, and to be uh, shocked to find out uh, when my uh, first uh, working duty day, find out that the wing was moving up from Itazuki to Yokota Air Base. And you had to get your family over there, overseas to Itazuki before March 15th, because March 15th was the cutoff date. Uh, and your family hadn't joined you by then. Now you had to wait until the wing had moved up to Yokota. And uh, that wasn't going to happen until May. So you're delaying getting the family over uh, by at least uh, uh, 30 to 45 days. So everybody was kind of in a rush to get the housing over there. Uh, a little story about that is... Uh, you didn't get two so sets of keys again, did you? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Uh, it was a little bit worse than that. Uh, I'm looking around to find this beautiful, beautiful, typical... Japanese house on the economy. It was like a movie set taken off uh, from a sayonara. I mean, just beautiful mm -hmm. home. So I get all excited, run over to uh, housing, and I went up to the guy and says, hey, I says, found a, set of, uh, found a home, you can start cutting orders on my wife. And he said, okay, he says, uh, what's the address of your ha house? Where, where is it? So I give him that, and he takes this book out, and he's you know, going through the pages, and he says, you can't have it. And I said, what do you mean I can't have it? He said, at that time, the Air Force was maintaining rent control. They wouldn't, they would uh, uh, put a house off limits if the owner, if the uh, owner would try to raise the rent when uh, uh, a tenant changed. Yeah. They would put the house off limits. Well, this home uh, owner had done that, so the house was off limits. So I thought, oh, geez. So I tell this buddy of mine, I said, Jerry, I said, you got to see this house I found. I mean, it's like from Saranara, you know. He said, man, that sounds neat. He says, show it to me. So I took took him over and showed him the house. He, that darn guy, he's still a friend of mine, but I've never forgotten it. <laughs> he goes back to housing. He says, I found a, a, a house. And he tells the guy, and the guy says, it's off limits. And, he, and my buddy says, what good is it going to be? All these houses are going to be off limits when we all move. We're, he says, the only person you're punishing by not letting us have a house is us. Uh, uh, he says, you know, the homeowner is going to, he's not going to be able to rent these houses out of house once we leave. He talked the guy into letting him have the house. So he ends up with this great house. <laughs> Meanwhile, the owner had a single bedroom house little like a maid's quarters right next yeah, to this beautiful yeah. house he had that so out of desperation i put that house in there tell it show it to the guy guy looks at it you can't have it what do you mean i can't have it he says it's only a one bedroom and you have two kids so you're entitled to two bedrooms and i said look all i want to do is get my wife over here and family i said uh, <clears throat> you gotta let me have it and he says okay he says if you'll sign a letter uh, willing to waive the fact that you're entitled to a two bedroom and you know, accept a one bedroom, we'll do it. So here I ended up in the maid's quarters to my buddy's <laughs> beautiful house that I had found. <laughs> it must have been a charm to talk that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah so. so did you actually fly over there in a 105 or did you get just go commercial? Uh, I went over commercial. A uh, uh, couple of my buddies. Uh, after graduating from our class, 
volunteer to ferry an airport, a 105 over there, brand new out of the factory. They, they'd go uh, pick up the 105 at uh, Melbourne, uh, Florida, which was a staging area where they would bring the brand new airplanes. So, so uh, a couple of my buddies uh, ferried one over there. I didn't, uh, that, that caused them to be separated from the family at Christmas time. Uh, I wanted to be at home uh, for Christmas with a kid, uh, with a family. So I would have liked to have done that, but you no. Know, so I went over the commercial. Mm -hmm. So was it just uh, 105s at the base? Uh, no, they had uh, a detachment of uh, 102s also. Okay. Uh, Air defense. Yeah. Now, here's a cute story about this. Uh, so there we are at Itazuki, and the alert barn for the 102s was at the other runway, naturally, and they would sit air defense uh, alert. And it was the 67th uh, Fighter Interceptor Squadron, the Lancers. Uh, there's their nickname, the Lancers. Mm -hmm. And on the alert pad, on the roof, they had in real pretty script, the Lancers. <laughs> Here it is, an alert pad with armed guards. And would you believe it? Some 105 guys managed to sneak in there, climb up on top of the roof, and turn the L into a D, the dancers. <laughs> <laughs> that they weren't happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, Vic, yeah, how did you feel that you, were, you, I guess, you were knowing that you were going to go into combat over Vietnam? Well, uh, it's the funny thing about it is, surprisingly, uh, you kind of looked forward to it because that's what you trained for, you know. Uh, so we were all kind of uh, anxious to see what it'd be like. So, uh, uh, sure enough, guys were volunteering to go, let's say, and, and then and squadrons were complaining. How come they're going before we're going? You know, the, the, squad, yeah, the yeah. squadrons were competing and all that. Well, that didn't last too long because pretty soon guys were going down there and not coming back. You know, mm -hmm. there, were, there were losses. And once the losses came, uh, the guys weren't quite so anxious to volunteer. They were willing to go uh, when duty called, when they said, you know, hey, it's your turn to go. Uh, one of my stories uh, is uh, my wife uh, uh, finally I had enough uh, because we're gone all the time. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, one year, uh, out of curiosity, one year I started tracking it, and in 1966, I was gone from home 216 days out of the year. Wow. So, so the wife finally had enough, and she said, says, you got to do something. She says, uh, uh, you know, these separations, family separations are just too much. You've got to change your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So uh, she had talked me into uh, resigning from the Air Force and go out and seek another career. So over the weekend, I, saw, I wrote up a, a, a letter of resignation. And uh, mm -hmm. over the weekend, Monday, I trudge off to uh, uh, work to turn in my letter. And uh, I report to work and they're on the flight schedule mm -hmm. it was a uh, it was a down day no flying but there's five names on the flight scheduler and one of the names was mine mm -hmm. so i said what's that all about you know i asked the clerk i said what's that all about and he said uh, i don't know sir he says but you're supposed to uh, those five names are supposed to report to the base theater so went there and of course the whole wings in the theater uh and uh, where there the wing commander comes out and says, uh, well, gentlemen, he says, in the past, we've been deploying down to the war as a unit per, per squadron. He says, uh, things have changed. He says, now we're going to be sending people down there individually to augment the war effort. He says, mm -hmm. and the first five names are these. And there's my name. You know, <laughs> so there's my name. Now, here I am holding my letter of resignation. And I'm thinking, People are going to think that I got a big yellow stripe down my back. <laughs> I heard this letter. Right <laughs> so I didn't dare turn that letter in. So, yeah. so I came home and uh, my wife meets me at the door, a big smile on her face. And she says, well, did you turn your letter in? And I said, no, honey, I'm sorry. And not only did I not turn my letter in, but pack, pack, my, pack my bags because I leave in two days for the war. And, it's like uh, a double whammy, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I'll tell you what, she was a, she was a perfect uh, 
uh, military spouse. I mean, she, you know, she backed me up all the way. And, and, you know, even though she wanted me to get out at the time, she, she knew that that's, I, I you know, it was a, a, a life I loved anyway. I, I love doing it. I, I have no regrets of my, uh, 24 year career. Uh, uh, the only regret I have is that it went by way too quick. Exactly. <laughs> but it, yeah, when, yeah. <laughs> when 24 years. Up, yeah. No, I, I was actually shooting for 26. I, I wanted to go for 26, but again, you know, these women, they're smarter than us guys. Mm. And, uh, when, uh, I approached 24, she says, you know, she says, I know you want to go for 26, but you ought to consider, uh, resigning at 24. She says, You'll, you'll still be young enough to start a second career. He says, surprisingly, if you go to 26, those two more years, it's going to put you over the hump where it's going to be awful hard to start a mm -hmm. second career. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and I thought, uh, you know, she's right. So so after 24 years and four months, I got out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, let's go back to Vietnam. So what kind of missions will you be flying um, over there? Well, when we're going up north, uh, most of our flights were against uh, lines of communications, bridges, um, a lot of bridges. Excuse me. Now, uh, initially, we also had a lot of targets that were off limits. Air bases were off limits. SAM sites were off limits. Uh, what else was? Uh, oh, there was a 30-mile circle around Hanoi and, and Haiphong that uh, there's a 10 mile circle and a 30 mile circle um, uh, over those two cities, Hanoi and Haiphong. Uh, no missions were allowed within the 10 mile circle. They're, they're prohibited. From 10 miles out to 30 miles in that region, uh, only operations approved personally by the White House were allowed in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, those were where the kind of restrictions were going against. Mm -hmm. And did you have uh, fighter escorts when you were going on these missions, or were you all like, would you just go on your own? Well, uh, initially, we were pretty much on our own. Well, initially, they tried to have 100 escort us, and uh, we didn't like it because uh, they, they would complain that we we're they were going too fast. They were having a hard, <laughs> hard, kind of hard time keeping up with it. We said, hey, we'd rather have the speed than, than the fighter escort. So, so initially uh, they tried to escort us, but then most of the time we wouldn't have. And then uh, when the F-4 started arriving, uh, they started flying our escort a lot. Uh, but a lot of times it was more detached. They went right with us. They were, uh, you know, in the area. Yeah. And they were uh, mixed suppression in, in the area. But here, here's a story for you again. Early 1965, Monthly, we're getting reports of these SAM sites being built. And the JCS and the head of the CIA would go to the White House and had pictures of these sites being built. And they'd say, we recommend that these be taken out before they're completed. McNamara, mm. I dislike that guy. McNamara argued against it. And his logic was, he says, they're only defensive. They're only defensive assets, and they haven't shot anybody down yet. Well, first of all, mm. the reason they haven't shot anybody down yet is they weren't completed. They were still being built, you know. Mm. So he would always overrule the GC, uh, JCS recommendations to go after them. That went three months in a row. Wow. So then finally, July 24th, we're flying, and uh, we're hitting a ammo uh, factory and storage area up near Dien Van Phu. We made contact with our escorts, which were a flight of F-4s, and we were shocked when we made contact with them. And they said, hey, we're carrying two 750-pound bomb bombs. We need to get rid of these things, or we're not going to have much escort time to uh, escort you guys. Right. So here we are carrying eight 750-pound bombs circling slow at uh, low at uh, at the uh, most efficient speed over the target area to let the air force roll in and drop bombs yeah. themselves Ooh. so man that took me off you know that that was old mcnamara's uh 
dictation that uh, they do that because he was um, he was quite good at math. He was being briefed on the number, the tonnage versus the sorties flown, mm -hmm. and he quickly mentally caught that. And he says, "Well, how come? Why is that such a low tonnage per sortie?" And the briefer says, "Oh, well, sir, you have to understand the sorties is all sorties. It's uh, the tankers." the escorts uh, uh, and stuff mm. like that. And he said, oh, well, we could improve uh, mission effectiveness by having the escorts carry bombs first also and drop there first. And no generals had enough guts to stand up and say, uh, Mr. Secretary, that's not a good suggestion. That's not a good deal. Let's, mm. you know, let's take it away from that. So sure enough, on that mission, we had to orbit while well, they went in and dropped. So then, oh, then the top prop. So now as they're leaving, they say, let us know when you're through so we can bug out. He says, because we're hurting on fuel. <laughs> so, <laughs> they, oh, my gosh. You know? So anyway, we, we rolled in, did our thing. We're leaving the target area. And we tell them, okay, we're leaving. So we're still on frequency. And the best we could tell from radio communication is they were slightly in front of us and slightly high at our 11 o'clock. Which I thought, well, that's, that's not bad because uh, uh, they're at least between us and Fukien, which was the uh, air defense base, uh, the bad guys. So they were kind of like a barrier there. So then we, as we were climbing up to altitude, we could see this th thin, serious clouds that we had to penetrate. And once we got in there, I was surprised it was a little bit thicker than we thought it was. And as we popped out, out of the clouds, all of a sudden we hear, what the hell was that? And uh, uh, number four of the of the escorts of the, says, I think three just got shot down. That was the first SAM kill of the war. Whoa, the, really? the guys, wow. when they, and, and they were in close uh, fingertip formation because of penetrating to the weather. And they just come out on top when three took a direct hit with a SAM. But they were cl close enough that all four aircraft took shrap metal. So uh, three got shot down. Uh, number one aircraft was so badly damaged that it never flew again. It, they, they repaired it and made it static display. Right. So anyway, that was the first shoot down of the war. So we heard it all on the radio. And the next two days, uh, we stood down uh, while JCS tried to figure out. Uh, and when I say we stood down, stood down that area where the SAMs were. Uh, they still kept on doing, flying missions for the south. So anyway, they stood down t trying to determine what they're going to do. And uh, uh, JCS finally convinced Johnson that those SAM sites uh, needed to be taken out. Mm -hmm. So he gave the uh, go-ahead, and uh, it was a famous quote from him. It was, take them all out. Well... That night, we, we uh, flight plan our missions, and uh, both air wings were going to be tasked for maximum effort. 48105s were going to go out and simultaneously hit all suspected SAM sites wow. at one time. And uh, uh, so we flight plan, and uh, in the morning, we, we got a, it was an early morning go. Uh, we uh, had a mass briefing. Uh, they briefed everybody's targets so there'd be uh, deconflicting, so we didn't have any mid airs. And um, so 48 thuds uh, from each base uh, was going to, uh, no, no, excuse me, 48 thuds total, tw 24 from each base mm -hmm. were going to go. So we had the mass briefing. Uh, then we broke up for our individual briefings, and we're in our little briefing room briefing individual flight when all of a sudden a guy sticks his head in there and says, hey, everything's put on hold. McNamara had gone back and presented his case to Johnson and convinced Johnson that, hey, if you have to do this, okay, go after the two suspected new sites that uh, were suspected of shooting down there, but don't go all out because he says, now you'll be escalating the war. So he convinced mm -hmm. Johnson at the last minute, it got changed to just mm -hmm. the, the 
the two uh, newest suspected sites to go after that. Wow. I mean, wow, wow, that story didn't know any of that. That's crazy. Yeah. But uh, yes, one, one story to another. Let's talk about your ejection and that famous photo that came out. Tell us about that, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I was uh, on a two-ship mission. Uh, I was flying with the weasel, Iron Hand mission. I Iron Hand was the code name when you go Sam hunting. Uh, so I was on an Iron Hand mission, uh, only a two-ship because it was down right above the DMZ. Uh, the, the Sams had been gradually working their way down, and uh, there was th we were hunting for three new suspected Sam sites in that area. And uh, uh, so we're flying along, and as we approached the first Sam site, it was under a uh, undercast for us, but it was overcast for them, and you couldn't see the ground. Well, you didn't want to go Sam hunting unless you can see the ground because the best defense against the sand is it can, it can spot the launch. The launch, the, is, the booster is so powerful, it just lights up and throws up all this dust. And, and while, it, the, while it's in the boost phase, you can see it's like a big flame coming out of there. So uh, it's, that way you, you can defeat the missile by putting it off to its wing. Uh, you you got to force it to start coming back down. And then when you can't stand it anymore, you say he's as close as I want him to be. You pull up, and it tries to go with you, and its small wings make it tumble, and that's and that's how you defeat a missile. So anyway, so because we couldn't see that one, uh, and I, I, the guys I was flying with, uh, the rest of the souls, they both have flown west since then. Uh, great, great we, uh, weasel crew. Uh, so he said, "Hey, we'll bypass." This one because of the cloud cover. We went up to the second suspect. We went, went feet wet, went up the coast uh, to the second suspected one, uh, which was at Ron's Ferry. No activity at all. Turn inland. Now we're headed for the last suspected site, which was about 30 miles inland. And as we're approaching it, um, the backseater of the, the Ewo says, okay, he says, I'm picking up an intermittent uh, uh, radar gun. He says, but he says before I can get a lock on him, he, he goes off the air. So then we got to the, where the third suspected site was nothing there. So the, the flight lead says, let's go back to the first one and see if the weather has cleared out. So I double clicked my radio to acknowledge that I understood what we were doing. We started this hellacious uh, or this big turn to the left to go back out to the water when I got a hellacious compressor stall. It, it was so powerful, it knocked my feet off my rudders. Wow. Now, the 100 was prone to compressor stalls. Uh, anytime you got slow, high angle attack, it would compressor stall. You wouldn't even ride them up because uh, it was standard for a 100. 105 hardly ever compressor stall. If it compressor stall, that meant there was something wrong with the engine. Mm -hmm. So I immediately realized I had an engine problem. And when I experienced it, it just coincidentally happened that I was pointing directly towards the home plate, the home base. So I immediately rolled out, headed for it, and I really thought I got an engine problem, but I'll be able to nurse it back home. So meanwhile, <laughs> uh, when I get excited, I talk too fast. And I remember going through my head and tell Lee that you have an engine problem, but you better speak, uh, speak slow because they'll never understand you. You speak at your normal excited uh, speed and they'll never know what happened to you. So sure enough, on the radio you can hear, because I have a recording of this because uh, uh, the weasels always record their missions to analyze the frequencies of the SAMs and all that. So anyway, uh, my radio call goes like, we, we were Clipper. He, he was Clipper lead and I was Clipper too. And it, the radio call went like this. Uh, uh, Clipper, uh, Clipper lead, uh, this is, uh, this is Clipper 2 days after business stalls. <laughs> he goes, you what? <laughs> I just had a bunch of compression stalls. <laughs> so, so, uh, so 
But unfortunately, I rolled out, and he had kept on his turn. So now he rolls back. So now I'm trying to get the upstairs to hook up with me again. And the uh, 105 had a beautiful ADF function where if somebody's transmitting, you could go to the ADF function, and the needle would point right to where he is. So he keeps on saying, give me ADF steers. So I'd say, okay, uh, she's still compressor stalling, you know. And uh, and he says, uh, get rid of your bombs. So uh, <laughs> I remember asking, safe or uh, or armed? And I, I think he said safe. So I think I, I dropped him in the safe position. And so then uh, as we went along, I couldn't maintain airspeed or altitude. I was on a gradual descent because I was compressor stalling so bad that I left a trail of crumbs where the enemy could follow me because – after that, I uh, got rid of the uh, mirror rack the, where you hang your bombs. Uh, then I got rid of the, the – the first I got rid of the tanks. First thing I got rid of, bombs, tanks, mirror rack, then the airplane. <laughs> so I left them a trail to find me. <laughs> so anyway, so uh, uh, finally – so I finally transmitted. And um, I was always impressed by a good buddy of mine uh, that uh, – uh, bailed out when I was leading him in a flight, uh, non-combat. This was over in Korea. And uh, what impressed me was when he went to bail out, he called hooking up his lanyard on, on his D-ring, which uh, uh, bypassed the altimeter and timer, and it would, you'd get an immediately open parachute. So you'd want that hooked up on your D-ring if you're going to do a low altitude uh, bailout. So uh, I always remembered uh, that I was impressed that he had the presence of mind to call hooking up his lanyard. So sure enough, I did the same thing. I said, okay, Clipper 2, hook, hook up, uh, up his lanyard, and I'm going now. And he said, Roger, I, I remember him saying, Roger's is as good as any place. <laughs> so <laughs> so I uh, pulled the handles up. Well, we were in the midst of of a modification at the time the fleet was getting modified and they're converting the seat from the uh, uh, shell blast that shot you out to a rocket seat which made a much smoother ejection well with the old system when you pull the handles up the canopy would go you squeeze the trigger boom you get shot out the new system when you raise the handles all it did was arm the system. Mm. Then you had to squeeze the trigger, canopy go, and you'd follow two tenths of a second later. Well, when I pulled up the handles and the canopy didn't go, I was so used to the old system because I'd flown the airplane so long under the old system that I thought, oh my gosh, the system has failed. I'm going to have to blow myself through the canopy. Mm. So here I'm trying to get the nerve to squeeze the trigger. And I know I have to do it. But I'll tell you what, there's some apprehension getting ready to bail out. Yeah. So I remember trying to get the courage to squeeze the trigger. And I'll never forget how sensitive that trigger was because it seems like when I finally did touch it, I no sooner touched it, it started squeezing it. And man, they were in the canopy and then I went out. So I was very pleasantly surprised at that. And I remember it was a nice big, uh, oh, I went out so slow. That I could, I, I remember reading the, the the instrument panel, 172 knots, which is slower than what we flew final at in the 105. <laughs> you, you fly uh, the 105 at 183, and I'm, I'm at the 172. Uh, and uh, uh, altimeter was 3,700 feet. Uh, actual above terrain was 1,700 feet. Uh, nice big uh, slow arc. Did a somersault over the top i remember seeing my feet against blue sky and then as i came back around i see this 105 go by me and i remember cussing lead out because i thought it was him and i thought to myself lead that's just goddamn you don't have to get that close to me and then i realized it wasn't lead it was my airplane that i just left <laughs> <laughs> so, so i kept my eye on it and i watched it and it slowly started a uh, left bank turn and crashed into a mountain range about five miles away. So I saw the airplane hit and explode. And I remember thinking, boy, I'm glad I wasn't in there. Mm. So now I'm coming down the chute, very mild opening chute. 
because I'm going out so slow. And uh, so I start preparing for a uh, tree landing because I'm coming down a very dense, ju dense jungle. So I uh, cross my leg to protect the family, you know what, mm -hmm. <laughs> jewels. <laughs> and uh, uh, one hand in front of the riser, the other hand behind the riser, made myself as streamlined as I could be for the tree landing. And man, I'll tell you what, when I hit that tree, it was a sudden stop. And bang, and then like that. Next thing I know, I find myself hanging upside down. And what happened was my right ankle was wedged between a, a split and uh, the tree, uh, two branches right wow. there. So I'm um, uh, up, hanging upside down. And uh, so it took me a while try, attempting to do inverted or upside down uh, sit-ups to grab that, that branch. After several attempts, quite a few attempts, I finally succeeded, got on, on the branch, pulled myself up. I was tired, and all I wanted to do was get off that tree. Mm -hmm. Well, in Southeast Asia, those trees grow up to 200 feet. So guys were releasing themselves from trees, not realizing they were that high, and falling 200 feet and breaking mm -hmm. bones when they hit the ground. So they had just installed a 200-foot lanyard wound in, inside your parachute pack. So you don't put up this little panel, pull out the, uh, the, your, the, that riser, put it through the, uh, or the lanyard, put it through the risers, come back, and then hook it on to your uh, harness here and release yourself. And now you can control your descent uh, by uh, where you put the, the, the lanyard. If, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're heading close to you, you're coming down fast. You want to slow down, you pull it out a little bit, you mm -hmm. know. Or it might have been vice versa. It's been so long ago since memory. So anyway, so that's what you're supposed to do. Well, I want to get off that tree so bad that I, and, and we'd only been trained in that new system once. I wasn't sure I knew how to do it correctly. So what I did is I took my helmet and I dropped it. So I try and get an idea of how high I was. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I released my helmet, it disappeared into the jungle. It was so thick. Mm. So that didn't help me any. I didn't know. So then, uh, desperation, I did something very foolish. Chancy, but, but I said, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to release myself and hope that I'm not too high. So I released myself. Plump, to my surprise, only dropped about six feet and I was on the ground. Wow. That, meant that, that, that meant that when I was hanging upside down, with my foot wedged in there, my head was only about three feet off the ground. Oh, so you're lucky there then. Yeah, very lucky there. So then we got uh, 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 down there and uh, took out the, oh, so the very first thing I did is I, uh, the backpack, parachute backpack, carried a beacon. So when a guy would bail out, it automatically would transmit, you could hear the, the beacon and you know somebody's uh, bailed out. Well, the procedure was to turn that beacon off because that beacon would interfere with your survival radio. So I opened the little panel and I turned off the beacon. So now I make contact with the, uh, uh, my lead and I keep on hearing him say, secure your beacon, secure your beacon. And I'm thinking to myself, I did. Why are you telling me that? You know? So I thought, well, I better check. So I checked and sure enough, my beacon had been packed erroneously it had been packed in the off position and still the on position. Right. So when I turn it without looking at it, I actually turn it on instead of off. <laughs> so did that, corrected that error. So then I got my hand radio and uh, it was, I submitted a redesign from my experience. What happened was uh, your uh, uh, mode switch for your survival radio would go from off to uh, uh, beacon, no, off, talk, beacon. So when I pushed on it, I pushed it to talk, but in my excitement with the adrenaline pumping, I pushed right through talk and went to beacon. 
So now he's talking to me with voice. I'm answering them with beacon, you know. And pretty soon he, uh, the guy is smart. Pretty soon he realizes what's happening. So he says, let's start over again. He says, uh, if you're reading me fine, give me one beep. Beep. Good. I understand you're reading me. Uh, if you're uh, injured, give me one beep. Well, no, if you're injured, give me two beeps. Well, I wasn't injured, so I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, geez. So I kind of kept quiet. And he said, uh, Roger, understand you may be injured. I thought, no, you know. So anyway, we had to start over again. Make long story short, he was talking to me in voice, and I was talking to him with answering beeps and mm -hmm. beeps. So he, uh, but smart, you know, playing 20 questions. So anyway, he finally said, um, we got the uh, search for the, on the way, uh, go off the air, conserve your radio for, uh, uh, and come back up in 15 minutes when air assets get uh, nearby. Uh, so then we, I did, uh, and then, so I'm not, so now I'm sitting and they're waiting for those 15 minutes to go by. Uh, and all of a sudden I start, I get aware of all the jungle noises and you'd be surprised the jungle noises. I mean, Branches are constantly breaking, mm -hmm. falling down. There's birds uh, whistling. And then it, it, uh, the bird behind you would answer him. He's like, oh, <laughs> I'm surrounded by the enemy, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so I, I realized I'm looking out there. And even though it's a dense jungle, I realized I'm kind of out in the open. So I started heading up towards the uh, uh, mountain, the uh, karst. Uh, you, are you familiar with the term karst? Do you know what karst is? No. Karst is um, uh, mountainous uh, mountains that, that's uh, indigenous to that area, uh, almost volcanic, uh, very okay. rough, right. and, and also very porous. There's caves in there. So, so I I went about 200 yards up to this range of karst that I'd seen come down my chute, and I'm thinking to myself. Okay, I, now I'm here, and I, I got to hide. And it's surprising with the adrenaline pumping how narrow vision you have. So I'm thinking, where can I hide? Well, as I calm down and my vision expanded, I see these cave entrances, caves, so, so you go in there. So I went in there. Man, a few steps into the cave, dark as can be. I had to stand there a while and let my eyes get accustomed mm -hmm. to it. Then once I... I uh, I got accustomed to it. I could see it. It was like a labyrinth. I could go straight or I could take a passage to the left or a passage to the right. Mm. So I went to the left. Typical fighter pilot, pilot pilots always turn left. So I went to the left, uh, went uh, several feet down there, and it's really getting dark. Now there's a passage way to the right. Went to the right, went down there. And now I'm starting to get a little worried about will I be able to find my way back out? You know, I was, I was only leaving the trail of crumbs. So on, on that, when I made that right turn in that passage, there was an indentation in the wall where I could lean up against it and somebody looking, if they were just looking down that passageway, they wouldn't be able to see me because I'd, I'd be in this indentation. So I'm there and I'm uh, uh, there and that's the first time I think I kind of calmed down and came to the realization what was happen happening to me mm -hmm. because I remember I think that was the first time I thought of family. And I thought to myself, you know, my boys are old enough. Uh, they're uh, uh, six and five. They'd be old enough to re know, remember me if I didn't get rescued. But I had a daughter that was just turning, that same month was just turning one year old. She would have never known, known me. Mm -hmm. So I turned to my faith, said a little prayer, dear God, get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and uh, non-believers are going to say ah, it was just coincidence. Being a believer, I thought that he answered my prayers because I no no sooner said, "Dear God, please get me out of here," and I heard the airplanes come back again. Mm. So, so I felt like he'd answered my prayers. So I go back out. Now, luckily, when I came back out this time, when I turned on my survival radio radio, I didn't accidentally go through that. Uh, position so instead of being beeping all the time uh, I was actual, uh, actually able to talk to, to them and um, 
So they, uh, so now uh, I'm talking to the Sandys, uh, the A1s. That uh, the Sandy was the call sign for the uh, search and rescue uh, A1s. Uh, so now uh, I'm talking to the Sandys, and uh, uh, Sandy Seven was his call sign. He took over. Uh, he uh, took over the, the search and rescue. He was in charge. So he said, uh, "Can you, uh, he says give me an ADF steer?" So I said, Roger. So I gave him an ADF steer, and I'm looking up, and now I'm feeling uh, raindrops that's hitting me, and I look up, and it's totally overcast, and I hear him say, "I see a hole over here." He's, he tells his his women, he says, "I see a hole over here. I think I can spiral down and get underneath the stuff." He says, "Stand by. I'll let you know." And I think to myself. Man, this guy's got some big brass ones because <laughs> I'm looking up and all I can see is this car disappearing into the clouds. And I'm thinking to myself, this guy's going to come down there and find a hard cloud, you know. And now he says, give me a steer. So I give him a steer. So he flew right over me. And as he flew right over me, I said, Sandy Seven, you just went right over me. <laughs> no acknowledgement, no, no wing rock, no acknowledgement, nothing. And I thought to myself, Shoot, he uh, didn't hear me. Well, reading the transcripts from the command post off the ship, uh, off of the talk, Tonkin Gulf there, uh, I, I've, I was able to read that he did hear me. He was just playing it real smart. He didn't want to give my location away, so he didn't want to rock or he didn't acknowledge just in case the guys were hearing me. So, so he was it's smart. So anyway, they... Um, don't like to uh, clear in the rescue chopper until they know where you are because he's got to get her in and quick and now, otherwise they get shot down. Well, this Sandy, uh, I owe my life to him because he hung it out. He said, okay, he says, uh, we have only about 30 minutes of daylight left. He says, I'm going to clear the chopper in, see if you can uh, uh, direct them by sound. And I acknowledged. So pretty soon I can hear this and you know, one thing I had not screwed up, one thing I had done well is I'd maintained my orientation and in which way north was and all that. So I said, uh, and his call sign was uh, um, Archangel. And I said, uh, uh, Archangel, I, I, says, I hear you. I think you're one valley south of me. Come up a valley to the north, they acknowledged. And uh, now I can hear him louder. And pretty soon, I see him come up, and through this dense, dense jungle, I see him go left to right, pushes him through the, through the trees. And I said, "I see you. I think you just flew over my chute. Do you have my chute in sight?" And he goes, "Roger." And I got so excited, I said, "Okay, I'm only 200 miles north of the chute." And he goes, "You're where?" <laughs> <laughs> And I said, negative, negative, 200 yards, 200 yards. So this is Roger. So pretty soon he comes over there. And I'll tell you, those guys were good. Uh, they hovered right over me. They lowered the tree, tree penetrator. Only had to take two steps to reach it. So I pulled down the, uh, it's got, it looks like a, it comes down in a canvas bag. So it's real streamlined. So I can get through the trees. You unzip the bag. And you fold out three pedals, you sit on one and strap your legs over the other ones, mm -hmm. and then and then hook up the uh, safety lanyard to have you strapped into the uh, penetration. So, so I'm on there. Well, the spring in the clasp to hook the safety clasp to hook yourself up to safety, a uh, spring was either rusty or bent. But anyway, I didn't have enough strength in my thumbs to open the clasp completely. And every time I tried to hook it up, it would bounce off. Next thing I know, I hear through this megaphone, hurry up, let us know when we can pull you up. We're low on fuel. Man, that made me even more nervous. So now I'm <laughs> trying harder to uh, hook this thing up. Couldn't do it. So anyway, meanwhile, I'm, I'm holding the radio with one hand, trying to do this with the other hand. And so 
after the third call, hurry up, we're low on fuel. I thought, I was going to say, okay, I'm ready. As soon as I hit okay, that's all they needed, man. They jerked me up. <laughs> I, I'd lost my grip on the radio, but now I got two, cap- uh, two hands to hand hold on to the cable. So they pulled me up. I don't like high places unless I'm surrounded by metal, like uh, aircraft cockpit. So I'm going up there. I got my eyes closed, and I'm hearing squeak, squeak, squeak. And it's getting louder and louder. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? So I look up. Well, what had happened is the helicopter had drifted. So now the cable is being instead of straight down, it's this way, draped over this branch mm-hmm. and down. So I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be interesting. I wonder how we're going to handle this. So sure enough, boom, the old branch hits me and stops me. Stops me. And the branch was about that thick. So I thought, oh, man. And I'm not strapped in, you know. So they lower me down two or three feet, pull me up a little bit faster, hit it again. Anyway, they took uh, three attempts. Finally, the third attempt, and I'm hanging on for dear life because I'm not strapped in. Finally, the third attempt, my shoulder battering ram, I broke the uh, branch and free. So now all the way up. And uh, those trees, like I said, grew to about 200 feet. So finally I clear. And meanwhile, I didn't realize how dark it had gotten in the jungle. Once I got out on top of the trees, it was dusk. You could see the sunset, you know. And uh, and once they saw they had me free of the trees, man, that old helicopter tilted the nose and started taking off, <laughs> bringing, still winching me up. Finally, I feel somebody grab the nap of my flight suit, pull me in, and uh, now we're in the chopper. Loud as can be, so loud you can't talk. And this young-looking gunner, he was just so happy to have us. And he would look at me, and he'd give me the old thumbs up. I'd give him the old thumbs back. And uh, we're going along every so often. Every time he'd look at me, he'd give me the old thumbs <laughs> up. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm happy. And um, so then pretty soon he closes the... Uh, uh, door, uh, and we're off and running. Well, I'm thinking Air Force this whole time. And as soon as I got in the uh, chopper, first thing I did is I looked at my watch. I knew where the Air Force rescue units came from, and I knew where they were. So I thought, oh, in about 40 minutes, we'll land at Macon Phnom, the rescue base. So uh, uh, we're going along. Pretty soon, he hands me a May West to put on. And I'm thinking, just to cross the Mekong, I need a May West? So I did that. Then pretty soon he opens the, the uh, uh, door and starts throwing out anything that's not bolted in. Machine gun, ammo cans. And, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And then I remember his call. Hurry up. <laughs> We're low on fuel. Mm. Anyway, he goes out there. Next time here, you know, we land. And this is a long answer to your question. Talk, talk about that picture with the bug eyes. So we land. And I jump out, and I think I'm jumping into terra firma, and instead, because I think I've been rescued by the Air Force, not realizing it was Navy, I jump out, and I get this salt spray hitting me, and these camera flashes off like that, and that's why there's that shocked look. It looks like I'm, I'm shocked from yeah. the ejection. I'm shocked because I'm on a ship. <laughs> <laughs> how did I get here, you know? <laughs> so yeah. That's how that, any, any, and anyway, uh, when the chopper landed, it had something like five minutes left uh, of fuel left in it. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what an well, incredible story. I mean, I've read up about it, but hearing it from you personally is uh, yeah. it's incredible here. So, Vic, how many uh, missions did you conduct on the 105, and did you enjoy your time on the aeroplane? Oh, loved it. My fav- favorite fighter of all the fighters I flew. Uh, I ended up with 59 uh, combat missions up over the north. And like I said before, it takes 100 to get a, a combat tour. So I returned to the States without a combat tour. So uh, that's why I volunteered to go back to try and finish up. Sure, okay. Well, uh, you know, start off in the uh, T-34 for pilot training. Uh, and like I mentioned before, that was really a uh, uh, only 30 hours us to weed out the guys that weren't didn't have the uh, aptitude for flight. Uh, did primary in T-37s, uh, so six months. 120 hours, uh, did uh, another 120 hours in the T-33, the Lockheed T-33 uh, for basic flight training. Uh, then I went into the F-100 
uh, ended up with 660 hours in the 100 total. Uh, went into the 105, my favorite fighter, uh, high time jet, 1,120 hours in that. Wow. Um, then in, I instructed in the F5, uh, second favorite uh, assignment, uh, uh, so 700 hours there. Uh, then uh, uh, six miserable years of flying a big metal desk, non-flying job. I hated that. <laughs> miserable. Uh, then I was very fortunate that I was able to finally uh, get back in the cockpit. Um, my last job as deputy commander of maintenance for the 35th uh, uh, wing at George Air Force Base. Uh, if you were uh, rated, uh, the policy was if you were a maintenance commander and rated, you had to fly. <laughs> Throw me in that match, you know. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how I checked out. That's when I checked out in the F4, uh, seven hour or seven flight program, and uh, got to fly. Uh, then, uh, since that was not my primary job, uh, as I was head of maintenance, uh, didn't get to fly as much as I would have liked to, but I ended up uh, with 120 hours in the F4. So, Vic, we got a couple of questions from our patrons, if you're happy to answer them. Certainly. Okay, the first one is from uh, Alexander. Uh, when did your unit in Vietnam change their bomb delivery tactics from the doomsday tactics trained in Europe to the uh, formation delivery? Formation delivery, I'm, I guess he means. Huh. Good question. Uh, but I don't see it. So I didn't... Uh, um experience that formation uh, delivery uh in fact i i think uh the uh the individual asking that question is probably influenced by some something he saw film wise they were probably more air showish uh because uh in, in real combat i shouldn't say this i was going to say in real combat you seldom deliver uh, munitions in formation. Uh, I, I was going to say you never do, but I just thought of one where I did. Uh, mm -hmm. The first time we went against the SAMs, uh, we did deliver in formation. Uh, but to show you how uh, odd that is to do is the only reason we delivered information is because the frag, the fragmentation order, which is tells you uh, your time of target, uh, that usually doesn't tell you how you had to deliver them. Uh, stranger enough, had us uh, in for, come in information, and uh, uh, the reason for that was they wanted uh, concentration, ma uh, mass concentration of the weapons. So that's the reason we delivered information. So to answer his question is, uh, in combat you normally don't uh, do that kind of delivery, although it has happened. You, you usually you usually deliver a sing, you know, single at a time. Now. You, you can approach the target uh, in formation, uh, not a tight fingertip formation. Uh, you're more like tactical spread, maybe uh, 3,000 feet apart. Uh, and uh, uh, we went to, we, we went from high altitude uh, approach to the target. Uh, when, when the SAMs came in, uh, they were too effective at high altitude. So we came in at uh, 4,500 feet to the target, and then we'd pop up and roll on in and drop uh, on the tar uh, on the target. Now, you did you, did, you did want to compound the gunner's tracking and didn't want to come in singly. So when we'd pop up, uh, you'd take uh, second spacings, and as one guy's rolling from this side, another guy'd be rolling from the other side. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Well, hopefully that answered your question there, Alexander. And the last one is from Jin Zhang, and it says, uh, what sort of air-to-air -air training were THUD pilots given? We've kind of answered it, but maybe a bit, a bit more detail would be great. Yeah. Well, again, it depends on the type of uh, aircraft you're flying uh, and what its mission was. Now, uh, all of the fighters I flew were tactical uh, fighters, uh, which meant... Uh, there's more emphasis on air to ground than air to air. Uh, the guys I had to uh, train mainly in air to air uh, were the uh, interceptor uh, guys or guys that had a, a, a main mission of escort rather than 
attack and a target. Brilliant. Well, uh, yeah, hopefully I answered your questions there, folks. Uh, yeah, so some personal ones from here, me, uh, Vic. <laughs> so do you have any hobbies? Uh, well, I try my game at golf. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm more of a hacker than a golfer. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I used to do a lot of model building. Uh, <laughs> haven't done that in ages. Uh, I, I enjoy drawing. Haven't done that as much as I used to. Uh, so, uh, and, and I, I enjoyed uh, my time writing uh, my books. Uh, you know, I, I've written two books, uh, so I enjoyed that. I'm tempted, uh, I am tempted to do a third book, except when I write, uh, as much as I enjoy writing a book, computers and I don't get along. Uh, <laughs> I get kind of frustrated when I'm trying to write something, yeah, save yeah. something, and, and get uh -huh. screwed up. So uh, uh, my wife says she's not sure she could stand me writing a third book. <laughs> <laughs> she might be right there, but uh, yes. yeah, we all, all all of us readers definitely would like you to do that. But uh, we yes. already know this one, Vic. But it seems like it's a definite uh, for you. Favorite aircraft you've flown? Oh yeah, F one hundred five, with uh, no doubt at all, by by far. Uh, and then my second favorite was the F five. Uh, the one hundred came in third, and like I said before, what I liked about the one hundred is a tough airplane to fly correctly. Once you master it, you can fly anything. And the F4 uh, was my least favorite. Uh, on the positive side, uh, I loved its uh, responsiveness to the throttle. I mean, the, those J79 engines, man, you, you push that throttle and that airspeed indicator would really move. So Absolutely. that was the positive thing about that airplane. And it beat flying a big metal desk. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's always a bonus. Um, yeah. So is there an aircraft you'd love to have flown in your military career that you didn't get the chance to? Um, well, yeah, I would like to have uh, gotten some F-16 time. Uh, unfortunately, didn't get to do that. Uh, I, I, I missed out on flying the uh, newer stuff because, unfortunately, like I said, I, I went through a spell there uh, six-plus years of non-flying, uh, so I lost out on flying some of the newer stuff. You know, so I, I feel I missed out on that for sure. Well, you certainly had a, a decent run at like some amazing legendary aircraft. So, yeah, I can't feel too sorry for you there, Vic. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. <laughs> no, I, I, I feel blessed. I feel very fortunate that I got to fly what I did. Absolutely. And finally, can we find you online? Do you have like a Facebook page for your books or anything like that? Uh, you can find me on uh, on on Facebook. I I, I don't have a web page. Um, let me see how else. About your, your books are available on Amazon, and are they available? On yes, all? they they are available on Amazon. Uh, in fact, I just checked uh, today to see if they were still available on, on Amazon. And both uh, uh, the titles are uh, Thud Pilot. And the title of the other one is Hun Pilot. So, you know, H-U-N uh, for the 100, Hun Pilot and Thud Pilot. And they are available on Amazon. Yeah, and I'll link that all in the description once it goes live. But uh, oh, yeah, I, Vic, I want to say thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure talking to you. So thank you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Cheers.